Okay, here we go. Last time we were talking about random variables. Well, random variables are functions. of a certain sort, but our favorite letters for the random variables, well, are things like x and y rather than f and g, although they're functions. Random variables are functions, well, if the function is, is x, it's a function from whose domain is the sample space, and so it's assigning numbers to outcomes in the sample space, and we looked at a bunch of examples. The random variable is giving us some measurement of the outcome, like the sum of, the, of those dice, the weight of the chosen person in kilograms, uh, the number of flips it took before you first succeeded in getting a heads, and if the range of this random variable well, sometimes we'll write the x's like this to make it so we don't mix them up with multiplication signs or lowercase x's. And we talked a lot about the range of x. So you remember from calculus about the range of a function, a set of all values it takes on. For example, the range of the sine function is the closed interval from minus 1 to 1. Well, if the range consists of this, exactly the following numbers, say t1, t2, and so forth, then we define the mean of x, also known as the expected value, so that's given by this equation. Okay, we call, if we're calling it the mean, we'll, our favorite letter is the lowercase mu. If we're calling it expected value, we'll often write it like this. And it's a weighted average. We take all the numbers that the measurement could be, but each one weighted by the appropriate probability. And the idea is that uh, if we do the experiment a lot of times, we expect that the average measurement we get from the different runs of the experiment should be somewhere around the mean or the expected value of the measurement. Quick example. Suppose the measurement in question has only two possible values. It, it's always either one or six. And we, we're given the following probability mass function for, for x. So to say what the probability mass function is, we want to know two numbers. probability of being one, well, let's say that's a third. So probability of being six is two-thirds, and we want the expected value. Well, we just add up the one and the six, but each one weighted by the correct probability one-third and two-thirds, respectively. Yeah, in the, if we repeat the experiment a, long, a lot of times, we expect our average measurement, our best guess is it'll be around four and a third. There is, however, one hitch. Namely, this, this if right here. What if not? 
what if the, we have a random variable that simply cannot be written in the way I've written that as a bunch of numbers indexed by the positive integers, a first, a second, and so forth. Well, we're going to we're going to postpone this problem. Um, so here's we'll define it away. Uh, we'll say that a random variable is discrete. Discrete spelled like this. Uh, there's another English word pronounced discrete that's spelled differently. Um, they have an interesting history, they, but which we won't go into. Uh, if it's range, well, if it's range is countable. So now I have to tell you what countable means. Well, it means that we either have one of the following, that the range is finite. Um, that's no problem. So either one, the range is some finite set. T1, T2, It's a list like this, and it even stops eventually. Now, if the range is finite, there's no problem. That happened in this example here. The definition of expected value goes just fine. Or the range is infinite, but it can be counted. That is, we can make a list of all the numbers in the range using positive integers. A first one, which we'll call T1, and a second one. Yeah, but we just are using positive integers. And you might ask, well, couldn't we always do that? Well, we're not going into the, that exactly, but the answer is no. Digression. Digression means you don't have to know that, this for, for Math 3C, but I'm going to tell you anyway. That some sets of numbers are not countable. And here are two examples. The set of all real numbers is not countable. And the interval from 0 to 1 is not countable. And there's an interesting proof of that, which I'm not going to tell you today. So when we, for now, we're going to look only at discrete random variables. And for discrete random variables, we know what the expected value is. Now, when we get to section 12.5, we'll look at the so-called continuous random variables that are not discrete. And we will need a different explanation for the expected value, a different definition for the expected value. So for now, we're just going to look at discrete random variables. And we know how to calculate means Going back to the example, what if we want to change the random variable? Here's a new one. OK, so. If x is 
this random variable with this um, probability mass function. Look at 3x plus y, or 3x plus, uh, 3x plus 7, and call that, call that y. It's a random variable. That is, it's assigning numbers to outcomes. It takes whatever number x, whatever measurement x gives us, it triples it and adds 7. Let's find its expected value. Well, what value, what measurements could y possibly give us? That is, what's the range of this random variable? Well, the measurement x can only be 1 or 6. And if it's 1, we'll triple it and we'll add 7, that gives us 10. Or it could be 6, we'll triple that, add 7, 25. So every time we run the experiment, the measurement y is either going to come up 10 or 25, and we know the probabilities. So the expected value of y well, it's 10 with weight one-third, or it's 25 with weight two-thirds. 10 thirds. Uh, 20. The expected value for y is 20. Notice. For x, the expected value is, was 4 and a third. What if we take that 4 and a third and triple it and add 7? Well, when we triple 4 and a third, we get 13. We add 7, we get 20. Not a coincidence. I claim this always is, this sort of thing is always going to happen. Because when we triple all the measurements, that's going to triple the expected value, the weighted average. If all these numbers that go in here get tripled, it's going to make this sum three times as large. And if we add 7 to all the measurements, that's going to boost the uh, expected value by 7. But let's write this down as a general rule, because we'll need to use these properties properties of the expected value. Well, the first one is pretty trivial, so we'll just give it number 0. A random variable is a function. The simplest functions are constant functions. So what if we have a random variable that's constantly k? Well, for our average value, we're going to get k. For a constant function. Uh, we run, we plug k into our definition of expected value. The probabilities have to add up to 1. We just get k. Makes sense. Yeah, if the measurement is always k and we average what we get, we know what's going to come out. OK, what if we talked about what if we triple all the measurements? Or more generally, for some constant c, if we multiply all the measurements by c? 
Well, that's going to multiply the expected value by C. We were, in our example, C was 3. What if we have two random variables, x and y? We can form a third random variable, x plus y. That is, we can take the measurement x gives us and the measurement y gives us and just add them together. Well, that's a little more complicated than the previous ones, but the average is just what you expect. If you, we get a, a sum, if we separate all the x terms and all the y terms by themselves, we get the expected value of x plus the expected value of y. This does not hold if, does not always hold for x times y, by the way. That's something we'll come to later. But, it hold, but it, for x plus y, yeah, the expected value is just the sum of the two means. And, well, 2 prime, what if we combine the previous rules, we get the one we need over there. What if y is a constant? Well, by property 2, the expected value of x plus a constant is the expected value of x plus the expected value for the constant. By property 0, the expected value of constant is just, of course, the constant. So by, if we combine uh, 2 and 0, And as a special case, we can say that uh, the expected value of 3x plus 7 will be the three x plus seven. Well, by property 2, it's the expected value of 3x, which by property 1 is 3 times the expected value of x, plus the expected value of 7, which has no surprises. In other words, it's not a coincidence that we got the same number both ways here. Well, we're going to continue this list later for some, some more properties. But next we want to look at how to measure how far x is away from its expected value, from its mean, when we run the experiment. we get some measurements, and maybe all the measurements are really tightly clustered around the mean. Or maybe they're really spread out, and we'll want to know which of the two. How far is x apt to be? So the probabilities will come in. From its expected value. Well, just off in the margin, let's scribble some things that we might look at. We could look at uh, a new random variable, say, x minus its mean. This measures how far x is above or below its mean. Yeah, but 
really what we'd like to know is we could look at this random variable, the, simply the distance between x and the mean. Or the one that works out best, and so it's the one we're going to do. We'll take x minus mu squared. OK, so end of scribbling in the margins, now we're going to do it. We define the variance, OK, another terminology, uh, the, the variance of x. To be the expected value of the random variable x minus mu squared. Well, uh, there's another thing. Let's give this a name. We'll call it the variance of x. Okay, And we'll give it that a three-letter abbreviation. But there's another way to write the variance that, for calculations, especially for hand calculations, tends is often easier. So we'll want to know both of these equations so we can use the easier one. That. The variance can be written in this form. It's the expect. I wrote that down wrong. Okay, quick fix that before you see it. The expected value of the random variable x squared minus mu squared. Now. The thing I wrote down first is not usually this, the same as the thing I wrote down sec second. That is, the expected value of x times x is not the same as the expected value of x, and then you square that. In particular, if we go back to that example, up there, calculate the expected value of x squared. We don't get the square of 4 and a third. So we have these two equations for the variance. But to be sure that they're both right, let's set ourselves the following problem of deriving the second equation from the first one. That is, we start off with the first equation as our official definition of variance. And let's derive the second equation. So we start from our definition of variance. It's the expected value of the random variable x minus mu, that quantity squared. And we're going to keep working on this and hope to end up with that second equation. Well, let's multiply this square out. It's x squared 
minus 2 mu times x plus mu squared. So it's the sum of these three random variables. And property 2 says the expected value of a sum is the sum of the expected values. Well, we have to use property 2 twice, but because there are three of them. But luckily, we have property 2 in front of us. It's the expected value of x squared plus the expected value of minus 2 mu times x plus the expected value of the constant mu squared. Well, now we're getting close. By property 1, a random variable times a constant, the constant being minus 2 mu. As we apply property 1, where c is minus 2 mu, so that constant comes out in front, times e of x, and mu squared is this constant. Property 0 says the expected value is just mu squared. E of x is the same as mu, just different notations. So we have minus 2 mu squared plus mu squared. What do you know? There's the second equation. And often, what we want is actually not the variance, though. We want the square root of the variance. So one more bit of terminology. The square root of the variance is called the standard deviation. And if the standard deviation is small, that's telling us that the measurement x is usually close to its mean. The standard deviation is large. It's telling us that often the me we get a measurement that's far away from the mean. If the standard deviation is 0, well, I should write down. But we also define standard deviation of x. Our favorite letter for the standard deviation is the lowercase Greek sigma. Okay, that's a sigma, the lowercase sigma. And it's the square root of the variance. If sigma is 0, then there's no chance for x to be different from its mean. Um, the square root sign means, of course, we're taking the positive square root. Well, if the variance is 0, this could be 0. Yeah, the, the standard deviation is always a non-negative quantity. Taking the square root is at least legal. That is, the variance can never be negative. It's the expected value of the random variable x minus mu squared. Because we've squared it, this random variable can't go negative. So over here somewhere, we perhaps should have said that the variance can never go negative. greater than or equal to 0. And the only way it can be 0 if 
is if x has no chance of being different from, from its mean. Well, let's try it on a problem with some numbers. Here's a random variable. And of course, we'll use a discrete random variable because we don't know how to calculate the expected value of a random variable that fails to be discrete. So its, it's range consists of is a set of four numbers. That is, we're considering a situation where the experiment gives a measurement that's always one of the following four numbers. So we'll make a chart. The, num the, the measurements always come up 0 or 1 or 2 or 3. And calling the random variable x, I want to tell you what its probability mass function is. So we need the probability that it comes up 0. We'll say one tenth of the time it comes up zero. Half the time it comes up one. Uh, Thirty percent of the time it comes up two, and sometimes a tenth of the time it comes up three. So, in other words, the range we're talking about is just. this set of four possible measurements. And these are the probabilities for the different measurements. So let's assume we have, we're looking at this random variable. For starters, let's calculate its mean and the, its standard deviation. Well, the mean we've done bef in a previous problem for uh, a different random variable. So we run the same method. We're going to do a weighted average. Of the four possible measurements, 0, 1, 2, and 3. So let's fill in the weights, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, Point three, point one. So let's see, we get uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.6, 0 0.3. Um, one point four. 1.4 is not that doesn't belong to the range. I mean, it's not even the range consists of these whole numbers. Uh, right in the middle of this list would be 1.5, but because one is more likely than two, let's pull the expected value down a little from 1.5 to 1.4. The expected value has to be somewhere between the smallest possible measurement and the largest one, of course. So if we get a mean of minus 3, then we've made a mistake. Uh, standard deviation. Well, we're going to use the second formula there, because it's easier for hand calculation. So we need the expected value of x squared. Well, x squared can be 0 or 1 or 4 or 9, right? Because the measurement itself can be one of these numbers. And we 
we put in the right weights. Oops. We put in the right weights. And uh, perhaps I did this calculation ahead of time. It's not, not that hard. 2.6. So the variance of x. So we want the expected value of x squared minus v squared. So 2.6 minus the square of 1.4. And I did do this calculation ahead of time. It's got two decimal places there. 0.64. Ah, the standard deviation is the square root of that, and the square root of that is 0.8. Well, that's part A of the problem. Now suppose we run the experiment. We want to find the probability that the measurement we get is going to be 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 is within one standard deviation of its mean. Well, let me say that more explicitly. We want the probability of a certain event. The event says the event consists in the outcomes where the measurement, which is going to be different from the mean, the measurement is never equal to 1.4. But we want the difference to be no more than 0.8, the standard deviation. So there's two ways to say that. Uh, the distance between the measurement and 1.4, the mean, is no more than 1 times the standard deviation. Or the other way to write this inequality, we get a measurement somewhere between mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma. If the measurement we get is no more than the mean minus one standard deviation, or is, is at least the mean minus one standard deviation, but it doesn't go too high. It's no more than the mean plus one standard deviation. Ah, oh, well, written like this, the problem is not so mysterious. We know these numbers. The mean is 1.4. Standard deviation is 0.8. So mu minus sigma is 0.6. Mu plus sigma is 2.2. The problem is merely asking for the probability that we get a measurement in this range, in the interval from 0.6 to 0.22. Well, the measurement never comes out to be 0.6. It never comes out to be 0.22. But if the measurement comes out 1 or 2, it's in that range. If it comes out 0 or 3, it's not in this range. So 
So we're looking at nothing but the probability that the measurement comes out to be one or two. One, or, one and two are in that interval. Zero and three are not in the interval. So we add the probability of being one, we know. The probability of being two, we know. These, there's no overlap. The answer is 0.8. That's telling us something. It says that if you do this experiment a lot of times, we expect that 80% of the time we'll get a measurement that's within one standard deviation of the mean. That is, it's within 0.8 of 1.4. And we'll do this problem later for other random variables in different situations. But first, let's continue our list of properties. So we wrote down some properties for the expected value. In doing these calculations, we'll also want some expected values for the variance and standard deviation. So going back to the simplest random variable, what if we have a constant function? What if the measurement always comes up 7? Then what's the variance? Well, let's write that down. So properties. So we had 0 and 1 and 2 and 2 prime. So the next is property 3 in our list. What if a random variable is a function? What if it's a constant function? K. Well, so it's mean as K. And K minus K is 0, always. Yeah, the variance of a constant function is 0. And so its standard deviation is going to be 0. The variance of, well, what if we have a We talked before about the expected value of the random variable plus a constant. The variance of a random variable plus a constant is simply the same as the variance of the random variable. That is, adding the constant doesn't change the variance. If you look at x minus mu, and then you decide to add a constant, well, the mean goes up by k, and the random variable goes up by k. The, x, the k's cancel. Adding a constant doesn't change the variance at all. And the same would hold for the standard deviation. Adding a constant does not change the standard deviation at all. What if we multiply the random variable by constant? Well, so before we were take, talking about what if we triple all the measurements? Ah, that will change the variance in general. If we triple all the measurements, we get nine times the variance we got before. Well, that's because we're looking at uh, the difference and we're squaring it. And yeah, if we triple the random variable, that triples the mean triples x minus mu, 
but, but x minus mu squared goes up by a factor of 9. And so for the standard deviation, well, our notation isn't perfect here, so we'll resort to subscripts. If we know the standard deviation of x, and we want the standard deviation for c times x, well, we'll take square roots here. If you take the square root of c squared, well, you might get c but not if c is negative. You will always get the absolute value of c. The absolute value of c times the standard deviation of x. I mean, so some examples of, of using these properties. The variance Well, say we have some random variable x, and we want to look at 2x plus 1. That's 4 times the variance of x. 4, because by property 5a here. When we double the random variable, the variance goes up by a factor of 4, and the plus 1 does not change the variance at all. And the variance of, say, 7 minus 3x. That's 9 times the variance of x. The 7 doesn't change the variance, but the minus 3 does. And we square it. And the standard deviation for 7 minus 3x. That's 3 times the standard deviation of x. But plus 3, not minus 3. The standard deviation is never negative. Last, notice, a word about why we want to take the square roots. Well, these measurements often have units, right? We, we take measurements, we, they come out in meters, or kilograms, or such. And so if, say the random variable has units of kilograms. Then, yeah, the mean also has units of kilograms. But the variance has units of kilograms squared, because it's the expected value of x minus mu squared. But the standard deviation has units of kilograms. So it makes sense to talk about uh, x plus sigma. They at least have the same units. It would make no sense at all to talk about x plus its variance, because they have different units. You can't add those quantities. And, or if the units are meters, same thing goes. The variance would have units of square meters. Got to stop for today.